given my orientation, I, I, my response to that question is relatively easy because the, the very purpose of science in general is to understand the world so that you can manipulate the world. Uh, that is to know what the consequences, the causal forces are, the consequences of your actions and, and things like that. So if given that politics has such a profound effect on our lives, if we want things to work well, we need to understand how they work. And that's the role that our research plays, I, I hope. Um, a, a, a very direct application of this was for, very early in my career, I worked on Capitol Hill for a year as an American Political Science Association congressional fellow. And I worked in both the House and the Senate. 1972-73, a rather exciting time. Uh, the Watergate hearings took place literally beneath my feet as a, a Senate office I was in was one floor up from, uh, from the Watergate hearings. And it was a time of a lot of change in governance, uh, uh, reforms in the House of Representatives in, in terms of the way the House worked. Um, uh, when I was in the Senate, I worked on campaign finance reform. Uh, it was one, one of the responsibilities in my area. I was in charge of all reform issues in, in the Senate office I was in. And my, my understanding of p causal political forces uh, were invoked every single day of my job. And, um, uh, one little known thing is, uh, one of the things I have studied since I was a congressional fellow is the impact of the reforms on the House of Representatives, um, including uh, a, a set of reforms called the Subcommittee Bill of Rights, which transformed the relationship between committees and parties in, uh, in the House. Um, I wrote the Subcommittee Bill of Rights. I, I and a, a legislative assistant in the office I did, wrote the original proposal, took it to the staff of the Democratic Study Group to propose it. Uh, four weeks later, it was part of the rules of the Democratic Caucus. And, that, and, and so one, that's relevance. And two, it's, it's only because I felt I had an understanding of what the consequences of this would be that I could propose what I, what I did. And so, yeah, I think what we do is pretty relevant. There were disagreements then about what the consequences of the reforms would be. Um, uh, two very prominent political scientists of the time, David Mayhew and Mo Fiorina, and that, uh, the latter from our own graduate program, uh, my first co-author as a graduate student, uh, uh, Mo Fiorina, um, saw these reforms after the fact, that is after all of these things have been passed, uh, uh, as, uh, as relatively inconsequential. Uh, that parties, the, the view at the time was that parties were not important uh, in Congress uh, and that uh, members uh, uh, did not want their parties and their leaderships to be strong. Uh, members wanted to pursue their own electoral or other interests, and uh, as David Mayhew said, the main thing that members want from their parties is to be left alone. That was the understanding at the time. And so the Democrats spend uh, uh, seven or eight years m making all these changes, and given that perspective, they said, well, these, these things are epiphenomenal. They're not, just not con consequential. They're not, they're not going to be important. And what most people thought, especially with the Subcommittee Bill of Rights, was that it had further undermined the ability of the Congress to get anything done. It had parceled power out uh, away from the committees to the subcommittees and, uh, and therefore made it more difficult to get things done. And the short-term effects looked to some degree like they were, those views were correct. And then it was only after a while that the, the consequences became more and more apparent of, of the reforms generally. And I think now that uh, almost 
it's almost universally believed that uh, that parties are consequential in Congress that and very powerful in the House of Representatives and the reforms are among the principal reasons why uh, that was true. I believed that the uh, the two parties were beginning to become more internally homogeneous in terms of ideology and more divergent uh, between them. And that, uh, that this was the basis for um, fostering the delegation of more power to two party leaders. And uh, uh, that, that uh, the liberal Democrats in the House of Representatives believed that they were not receiving the, uh, what, what should have been the benefits of majority status, that they were not getting policies through that they wanted to get through. And part of the reason was that the party leadership was too weak, and part of the reason was that the committee chairs were too strong. And the reforms uh, in the House dealt with those two things. They, they undermined the independent power of committee chairs, not, not their power generally, but, their, but the independent power, that their ability to exercise power independently of the wishes of the majority party. Um, and the ref other reforms strengthened the party leaders like by giving the speaker control of the Rules Committee again, for example. Um, and, and I believe that those were the things that needed to be done if the, uh, the majority party was to be able to work its will in the House as, as a group. In order to validate, support the, uh, the hypotheses that, uh, that I had developed, um, I tried to marshal a whole bunch of different kinds of evidence, uh, again, to, to work synergistically together in that. So first of all, there's a lot of quantitative evidence, in that, and the, the kinds of things uh, referred to just a bit ago. So evidence on the roll call voting behavior of members and how they had been transformed. That, um, uh, 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 to take a more general example uh, uh, related to Southern Democrats, um, uh, in 1969-70, the first Congress of the Nixon administration, the average Southern Democrat voted more often with the Republican Party than the Democratic Party. Um, that's about as vivid an illustration of a, 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 a party deeply divided on policy uh, that, you, that you could possibly have. Um, and then I, I traced uh, the roll call behavior of members from that point uh, to uh, to later, um, uh, to, uh, to the um, initially the early 1980s and the later 1980s, and in, in, in my current work, right, right up to the minute, uh, that we could observe uh, one more frequent uh, occurrence of roll calls on which the two parties split away from each other. So, so more more party conflict, party based conflict in in the chamber. And then in terms of the behavior of individual members, uh, the Southern Democrats as a group becoming more and more and more loyal to the Democratic Party, voting less and less often with uh, uh, the Republicans to the point that by the, by the uh, mid-1980s, uh, the average sub Southern Democrat was only a few percentage points less loyal uh, to the Democratic Party than the, the average Northern Democrat. So that's in terms of the kind of quantitative evidence. In that. Um, then in terms of qualitative evidence, um, I, I both um, drew a, a lot on the journalistic record. I, I am an inveterate clipper of uh, stories from newspapers and, and things like that. Uh, we do it electronically now, but, uh, but uh, uh, f physically clipping things to, to use as examples and, and more collectively as a sense of, of what was going on uh, in the real nitty-gritty of policymaking. And then I also did interviews with, 
with members of the House. Uh, I interviewed 25 Southern Democrats, for example, for my book on parties and leaders in the post-reform house. Um, and, and so I was able to ask them directly uh, uh, um, uh, about the kinds of questions we were interested in, and they could answer anonymously uh, uh, and, uh, and, and therefore be forthright uh, about, uh, about their views. And then uh, later on, other work I did, uh, when I moved over to the Senate, I worked on a project uh, uh, studying the Senate, and we interviewed 50 members of the U.S. Senate and, uh, on, on tape, um, uh, my co-authors and I. And, uh, and so I, I, I was being trained by Dick Fenno. I developed an appreciation very early in my career for the possible ways that interviews of elites could play a substantial role in both developing our understanding of what was going on and in providing evidence for, uh, for the hypotheses we developed. The sorting that we're talking about, the, 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 the two parties becoming more internally homogeneous in terms of ideology and more different from one another, had, had roots in the electorate. Uh, that is, things that were happening out, out in the electorate. The, uh, one of the most important things was, uh, and the, the, the source of uh, this, this paper I wrote, uh, and that is what was happening in the South, that, that the South had been because of the legacy of the Civil War, a almost completely democratic region in the country. Uh, the uh, Democratic Party carried the South in uh, uh, every presidential race. Um, uh, almost every member of the House of Representatives, I think in, in 1952, there were six Republicans and 100 Democrats or something like that in, from, from, in the House from the South. Um, from, uh, from the end of Reconstruction until 1961, uh, not a single Republican was ever elected to the U.S. Senate. So that's about as dominant as you can get. And then during this period, during the 1960s, 1970s, um, this started to change. And the South began to move away from the Democratic Party um, in presidential elections to, to uh, independent candidates like George Wallace and then to Republicans like Richard Nixon. Uh, uh, 1972, Nixon carried every southern state. Um, and, and so this realignment of the South had implications for the kinds of delegations that existed in the two parties in, in the Congress. That uh, Southerners, first of all, became a smaller portion of the Democratic Party in both chambers, uh, and therefore less influential from that point of view. And the, the Southerners that were still Democrats, they began to change. Um, uh, blacks began to be elected to Congress from the South, all, all Democrats. Um, uh, the white Southerners who were Democrats became more moderate and then liberal. Uh, um, and so the Southerners in the Democratic Party had been a very conservative block before the realignment, a very conservative block at loggerheads with the liberal Democrats from the North. Um, uh, during, through the realignment, these two groups, Southern Democrats and Northern Democrats, became more and more similar to one another, therefore less internal division within the Democratic Party, and therefore more willingness to make their party leaders more potent and, and capable via the reforms. And then the Republican Party, there, there was no Southern wing before the realignment. There were, there were virtually no Southerners. Um, um, as Southerners began to be elected to Congress as Republicans, um, they came in as extremely conservative Republicans over on the far right of the Republican Party. And so that moved the Republican Party in Congress to the right and made it more homogeneously conservative. And, 
uh, so, so those electoral forces were, um, uh, were the driving force behind uh, this change in the makeup of the party coalitions in the House and Senate, uh, which were in turn the basis for the reforms that, that we talked about. Uh, parallel kinds of things happened in the North too, but later. In terms of the um, the changes in the House and uh, and the reforms and the and the, the changes in among Southern Democrats, uh, I used uh, Jamie Witten of Mississippi as an example. Uh, um, so in the period of the 50s and 60s, uh, Witten was a medium seniority Democrat, served on the Appropriations Committee, and extremely conservative. Um, he had a voting record. He, um, my recollection is, I haven't refreshed myself on this today, but uh, my recollection is that uh, the proportion of the time that Jamie Whitten supported his party in the 1950s and early 1960s was about 15 to 20 percent of the time, not the, the, the other 85 percent of the time he voted with the Republicans. Then along come these reforms, which, uh, 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 let me take a step back. So this was this was fine for him because his position in the House at that point as a subcommittee chairman on the Appropriations Committee was immune from attack by his party. He, he became, uh, he, he got this position by seniority as long as he remained in the House and served on the Appropriations Committee as a Democrat, and as long as the Democrats were in the majority, he was going to be chairman of his subcommittee, and there was nothing his party could do about it, regardless of how often he voted with the opposition party. One of the changes that the reforms made was to alter that situation. They, uh, 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 rules were passed in the Democratic caucus that made Commit all committee chairmen and all subcommittee chairmen on the Appropriations Committee, which was the biggest and most powerful committee then, um, all of them were subject to a vote of the party caucus at the beginning of every Congress as to whether they should continue as in their positions as, as chairs of committees and subcommittees. So in one simple change, these people who had been completely independent of their party were now completely responsible to their party, that the party could take away from them this wonderful position that they had unless the party judged that their behavior was acceptable. And so almost overnight you begin to observe a transformation in the behavior of Jamie Whitten and other people like him and his party support score goes up and up and up and up until um, by the time that he was eligible to be chairman of the Appropriations Committee, not only was Jamie Whitten more loyal to his party than the average Southern Democrat, he was more loyal to his party than the average Democrat. And it wasn't because Jamie Whitten's personal political philosophy changed. It was because the rules changed and compelled him to adopt positions, public positions, that uh, he otherwise would not have done. Uh, so one of the things we study as political scientists what we try to determine is what impacts do rules have on behavior and outcomes. And, and this is, I think, a pretty powerful example of the impact that a rules change had on behavior that, uh, that, that's had very profound implications for the operation of the House of Representatives. David Mayhew's famous book, Congress, The Electoral Connection. The electoral connection is a very important thing, but it's not the only thing that drives, uh, drives the Congress. And, and one of the points of view that I've championed uh, in, in direct disagreement with Mayhew is that um, one of the core elements of his theoretical argument is that members do not care about policy outcomes. They only care about taking positions, and they take positions to make themselves electorally secure. Uh, but outcomes don't, don't matter at all uh, to members. This was not the Congress I saw firsthand. I, when I worked on the Hill, the, 
the members of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives were interested in changing the rules of the House, not so that they could posture and take political positions. They were deeply concerned about policy outcomes and wanted to produce different policy outcomes than the ones that the House of Representatives was, was producing because of the, the way it was organized. And that, this was a group of liberal Democrats who wanted to achieve liberal policy outcomes. And, uh, and they changed the face of Congress so that they could do that. And, um, and, and, and I think that that point of view has just become more and more and more relevant over the years. The, one of the driving forces of the polarization in American politics, in, in, in American political institutions, is, I believe, precisely the fact that the elites who are coming in are both more concerned about policy outcomes than their predecessors and more extreme in their views on policy outcomes than their predecessors. I got into political science because I was interested in politics. Uh, the, the interest in politics came first. Uh, it, it was not my first major. It was not my second major <laughs> as an undergraduate. And uh, it took me a while to find something that I was sufficiently passionate about, uh, sufficiently interested in, that I thought that I would want to keep doing it for uh, the long term. And, uh, and that's what happened to me with political science. I took a political science class and I said, this is it. This is what I want, this is what I want to do. I like to think that what we give them is a real scientific understanding of politics. That's one thing. Um, I mean, I, it is routine for me to tell my students the first day of class that I, I think of myself as a scientist in exactly the same sense that a physicist is a scientist. And, uh, and then I try and explain to them how the scientific study of politics is different from what journalists do or what historians do. Or, uh, uh, other kinds of people who are in, interested in, in politics. So I think that's one important thing we, we, uh, we give them. Another important thing we give them, I hope, is an, uh, an appreciation for the consequences of politics, that uh, the ubiquitous effect that politics has on the lives of ordinary people. And, and, and therefore, there's a reason to want to understand what goes on, that it's it's something you um, ignore at your peril, I think. <laughs>